All right, Brady, I got 1 o'clock Eastern. Is it okay if I go ahead and kick us off officially here? Let's do it. All right, cool. Well, good afternoon, everyone, if you are on the East Coast, and good morning, I should say, if you're on the West Coast or somewhere in between. Thanks for being here for today's Bloomerang webinar, The State of Recurring Giving. And my name is Stephen Shattuck, and I'm the Chief Engagement Officer over here at Bloomerang, and I'll be moderating today's discussion, just as always. And just some housekeeping items before we get started here, just want to let you all know that we are recording this session, and we'll get to that recording this afternoon, as well as the slides. If you don't already have them, hopefully you already have the slides. I have those out earlier, but if, if not, you'll get both of those things this afternoon, I promise. So if you have to leave early, we hope you don't have to, but if you do, that's okay. Just get you the recording, and uh, you can finish up the session uh, on your own time, I suppose. Most importantly, as you're listening today, please feel free to use that chat box right there on your uh, ReadyTalk window. We're going to try to save as much time as we can for Q&A. So don't be shy. If you have a question or comment as you uh, listen along for the next hour or so, let us know, and we'll try to get to it. Uh, and Brady has even agreed to answer questions offline as well. So hopefully we'll be able to get to those. You can also do that on Twitter. I'll keep an eye on the Twitter feed. Uh, at Bloomerang Tech if you want to send your questions and comments over there. And one last thing, if you have any trouble with the phone audio, we find that the – actually, if you uh, – again, if you have any trouble with the computer audio, uh, we find that the phone audio is usually a little bit better. So if you're having trouble with your computer speakers, your browser, whatever, uh, try dialing in by phone if you can do that, if you don't mind, if it won't you know, bother a coworker. Uh, try that before you totally give up on us. There's, an, there's a phone number you can dial in. Uh, in the email from ReadyTalk that was sent out when you registered. So just search for that and uh, give that a try if you have any trouble. And if this is your first Bloomerang webinar, I just want to say a special welcome to you folks. We do these webinars pretty much every Thursday. We literally only miss a couple Thursdays out of the year. We bring in a great guest. Uh, today's guest is no exception uh, for an educational session. It's just something we do to give back to the nonprofit community here at Bloomerang. If you're not familiar with our software, we've got donor management software that uh, pretty highly rated. We have, our customers tend to tell us that they like it. So if you're maybe in the market for that or just want to check out what we have to offer, visit our website. You can watch a video demo. Uh, we get people sandbox logins all the time if you want to get your hands dirty. Don't do that now because you've got a great presentation here coming up. Uh, but feel free to check that out later today or maybe later this week. Uh, but for now, I am really excited uh, to welcome today's guest, someone that I've been following online for many years, talking to, just sharing you know, nerdy data with all the time. And I'm really excited to have him here to share uh, some really cool research. We've got Brady from Next Factor. Hey, Brady, how's it going? Good, Steve. Thanks for having me. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited. A lot of people registered for this one. Um, and I just want to brag on you real quick. If you guys don't know Brady, like I said, he's a VP of Innovation and Optimization over at Next Actor. And if you have never checked out Next Actor, if you've never seen their website, please do. They are a really cool resource of information. They do lots of interesting data studies, um, some of which you'll you'll see the results of today in Brady's presentation. Um, very cool company. You may have heard them say they're down uh, in the Plano, Dallas, Texas area. So shout out to anyone listening from Texas. And uh, man, Brady is all over the place. He is a, a prolific writer and speaker. He has written or been featured in uh, publications like CBC, Christianity Today, NPR, Chronicle of Philanthropy, Huffington Post. Uh, he's spoken at huge conferences, including Social Media for Nonprofits, AFP Congress up in Canada, uh, the Cyber Grants Conference, TVCon. Um, just a great guy, too. And, and I've been following him on Twitter and, and keeping an eye on some of the uh, giving and uh, sign up experiments he's been doing over the past year. Uh, he's been really working hard signing up for newsletters and donating to, to nonprofits and just gathering data and uh, trying to, to share his findings uh, to the benefit of all of you. So uh, I'm just really excited for him to uh, share some, some cool data and research and best practices. So Brady, you've already taken up way too much of your time. I think you're going to do the screen share thing, but uh, take it away. Tell us all about the state of recurring giving, my friend. Sounds good. Let's get into it. And uh, thanks again for having me. Uh, always fun to be on. And uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. So uh, uh, as Stephen kind of mentioned, uh, I am a charity nerd, and we'll, we'll nerd out a little bit today. Um, here's what we're going to cover today. I'm just going to set some context for this research and study, like who the heck are we, why recurring giving, and 
some background information on the study itself, and then we'll dive into some things that we learned or I learned about recurring giving, the experience, and then communication that you can try. And throughout, we'll have ideas that you can try and test. And hopefully a lot of time for Q&A. And then just a couple tips that I found useful when uh, I'm doing webinars or online learning is write stuff down. If you have a piece of paper, that's great. Um, just get, get it out of your brain. If it's a question, it's a comment, it's an idea, if it's like I've got to get milk, whatever it is, write it down and get it out of your brain, and then it, it allows you to focus more. And then be curious. You know, ask a lot of questions. You can ask them in the session. There's my email, and that's Twitter. Ask questions are great. Um, and then focus on the main concept. I'll dive into some you know, specific experiments with some organizations, and don't get too bogged down in maybe that one experiment or who that one client is, but try to apply the bigger learnings to yourself and your organization. So um, who the heck's presenting? You've heard more than enough about me, um, and you've heard a little bit about Next After. We are a research lab and a consultancy. And those two things work together. And uh, at the root of both of those is we're trying to figure out why do people give? If we, if we can kind of decode why people give and use the web as kind of a research lab of sorts, we think that we can then help more nonprofits uh, raise more money, uh, reach more donors, and grow giving and generosity. But we're at a fundamental disadvantage or there's a real challenge to understanding why people give, and it's this. Fundraisers are from Mars and donors are from Venus. We look at the same thing like giving, but from very different perspectives. All right, we as fundraisers, we think that people come online to give, but donors generally come online to get. They don't wake up in the morning and say, oh, I'd love to give some money away today. Right? So we, that's one inherent difference that we have in terms of how we view uh, giving. And then another big reason is this thing, the curse of knowledge. And this really plays into our communications and how we promote our value proposition. Is We know too much. Right? You're passionate about your work. You're in your work every single day. And so we speak in a language that often donors do not understand. It goes over their head or we use acronyms. And so donors don't always understand what we're saying. So it creates this divide. And it's one of the reasons why we do these research studies, like the one I'll talk about today, is that if we can go out and make a bunch of donations or sign up for a bunch of newsletters, we can kind of have a better understanding of who donors are and experience from their point of view. And then from that, we can then shape kind of our work and marketing and fundraising communications. But we also collect a bunch of cool ideas of what organizations are doing. And then we can put that into our experimentation so we can get these insights and ideas that we can go and experiment and test to actually understand what donors do, not just what they say. And that's key if we're really going to understand donors. So that's our goal is to try to understand why people give, and that's a bit of our approach. Um, so we do a lot of research with our clients and studies like this, and we try to give it all away for free. So research like eBooks and webinars, we've got online courses and some tools to help you run experiments. All right, enough about us. Why did we focus on recurring giving? Well, the short answer is something like this. Uh, recurring donors are worth 5.4 times more than one-time donors over the lifetime. That comes from uh, the State of Modern Philanthropy by Classy. But you can basically pick a data source, and you'll see that recurring donors are worth a lot more over their lifetime than one-time donors. Yet, when I look out into the market, particularly in the U.S., I don't see organizations that are really focusing on recurring giving. And I wonder, why is that? Well, I think one of the reasons comes from Harvey McKinnon. He put it this way. He's the author of Hidden Gold and kind of a forefather of monthly recurring giving. He said, the single largest obstacle to successful monthly giving programs is buy-in. I don't know if we collectively get the buy-in in ourselves internally with our bosses or our colleagues to really make recurring giving important and bring it to the fore. So before we get into what we learned, I just want to highlight a few reasons about why recurring giving is so good to help you get bought in if you're not or get your colleagues and bosses bought in if maybe it's them who's kind of holding you back. So the first point is this. Recurring donors are good for you, your organization. If we look at that kind of one-time versus sustainer or monthly donor over time, here's looking at 1,000 donors of each, you can see how this revenue gap just widens and widens and widens and we're to the point where recurring donors are worth significantly more over their lifetime. And if you actually break this down by organization size, we can see something like this where recurring donors are 3.7 times more valuable for large orgs, but it goes to 12.4 times more valuable for medium and 11.5 times more valuable for small orgs. So another key point here is recurring donors are even more valuable 
for small and medium-sized organizations, of which probably most of you on this call, on this webinar, would fit into that small or medium size. So there's even more value of recurring donors for you. And it's a function of this, lifetime value. And now you might be saying, Brady, I'm on a Bloomerang webinar. I know everything there is to know about lifetime value because they talk about it all the time. And that would be awesome. Bloomerang is one of the best sources about lifetime value and donor retention. So they'll have a lot more, and they've got some nerdy ways of how you can calculate it. But fundamentally, lifetime value has two levers. One is the amount that someone gives, and the second is how long they give. So under amount given, there's a misconception that monthly giving is only worth it you know, years and years and years down the road. But that's not really true. The average recurring donor gives 42% more in one year than those who give one-time gifts. That's from Network for Good. So the average monthly donor gives more in a year, and they give longer because they're more likely to be retained. Here's a graphic from Bloomerang on the 2016 Fundraising Effectiveness Project. We look at the average donor retention rate, 46%. We all know that's not great. could be better. This is the most shocking statistic where 77% of first-time donors do not come back and make a gift again. Why that's so important is you can see if we can get that second gift, look at the repeat donor retention rate. It jumps all the way to 60. But look at this. Monthly donors give again and are retained at a 90% rate. Go have a party, monthly donors, right? So if lifetime value is a function of amount given and they give more in a year and time giving and they give more years, that boosts lifetime value. That's what we're all about. Go have another party. Okay, every slide now is going to have confetti raining down on it. Uh, just kidding. Okay, so just in case that wasn't enough, lifetime value, there's a few other reasons why recurring giving is good for you. For example, relationships because they give more uh, frequently over time, it allows you to get to know them better and build a relationship, which can lead to legacy giving and plan giving. Um, it's a predictable source of revenue, especially if you're a small organization. Knowing where that next check comes from is hugely important. So this allows you to kind of predict cash flows and budget a bit better. And there should be cost savings. You shouldn't need to be spending all the money on acquisition or trying to recapture those one-time donors because of these cost-effective giving platforms. So recurring giving is also good for donors. And for this, I'm going to go Bill Nye and go to some science. Uh, a couple studies from the Science of Giving book, uh, which we actually used in our uh, annual giving class that I helped teach at North Park University. So in this study, they gave $120 to people, and they said, here's what you can do. You can give it all away now. You can give it all away later at the end of 12 months. Or you can give $10 away for 12 months. And here's what they found. 61% of the people, more than twice the next closest, said they wanted to give it away $10 a month. And what doesn't make sense is if you wanted to help the charity, you should give it all the way now. If you wanted to help yourself, you should give it all the way later. So the least kind of logical thing is to give it away in $10 increments. But it's mentally convenient. Paying an in installment, our brain just understands. $10 a month, sure, easy, got it. So it's this mentally convenient form of payment. Another experiment here, they looked at happiness. So people gave different donations and then were told, they were asked how happy that made them. And what they found is that there's this kind of diminishing returns graph of happiness and giving. So the more that someone gave, it's not like they became exponentially more happy. They actually became a little less happy. The most happiness is in this range, smaller amounts more frequently. Well, hey, that's what recurring giving is. So recurring giving has this ability to maximize happiness and this perceived impact that adds up over time. So recurring giving is a high convenience, high impact way for donors to give. And the last key point here is recurring giving is growing and it's growing fast. So from MNR Benchmarks, they saw that recurring giving revenue grew 40% last year. Uh, and the Target Analytics Group attracts 38 different nonprofits and $2.52 billion of giving. They've seen 70% growth since, since 2013. And if we look at the for-profit side of things and the subscription e-commerce market, it's grown by 100% year over year the past five years. And if you think about it, think about things like Netflix or uh, Blue Apron or Dollar Shave Club or Ipsy Box. These recurring giving or these uh, subscription e-commerce products are increasingly popular. So recurring giving is starting to grow rapidly and should continue to do so. In that McKinsey study that I referenced with the growth in uh, e-commerce subscription, the main demographic is 25 to 44. So if you're looking for kind of a key demographic well into the future, 
uh, that, that's a key one, and they're, they're likely to become e-commerce subscribers. All right, so that's why recurring giving matters, and hopefully you know some of that, but hopefully it can help give you some more ammunition to double down on this strategy as, as essential for your fundraising. So here's what you need to know about the study. I'll go through it really quick. Um, we identified over 100 nonprofit organizations. There was actually 115, to be precise, uh, from nine different verticals. So the average annual revenue is from like half a million to three billion, and the average annual revenue is about 180 million. So definitely skewed a little bit to the larger side, and you can see the nine verticals there. So pretty evenly spread with a few more in disaster and international relief. But then we went out to each of these organizations and made three donations. We made a one-time gift, we made a second one-time gift, and then upgraded to become a recurring donor after one month. And then another, in another donor, we just became a recurring donor right away. We then monitored all the communications across four channels. So we looked at 500 and some letters, 4,000 and some emails, 83 phone calls, and six text messages over a three-month period. This was, uh, we started in February and ended at the end of April. We also wanted to see what happened when we reported the cards as lost or stolen. That's one of the most frequent ways why donor, recurring donors lapse. So we did that as well and captured it. And then we analyzed all the results. Uh, we categorized catalog the process about giving. We scanned every letter. And we put them into buckets, solicitation, cultivation, receipt, to try to score and get a sense of things across the market. So that's what went into this study. Now for the rest of the time, I want to focus on what we actually learned and what you can do to improve and optimize your recurring giving. So first part is the giving experience. Here's, here's some of the things that we learned. The first one is this. It, it's not that easy to find out where to make a recurring donation. So we found that actually one out of 10 organizations did not have a recurring gift option at all online. So the first idea here from Captain Obvious, if you want to grow your recurring giving, is have a recurring giving option. We also looked at just making the donation, and so how do we find it? Uh, so we looked at the donation call to action, and by far the most people just had donate, 71%. But many uh, organizations included in the study, it wasn't easy to find this call to action. If you look at this example here, you know, we'd look in the top navigation, and oftentimes there wouldn't be anything that was really clear, and we'd have to scroll and dig and dig, and there it is, all the way at the bottom. And here's why it's important. Here's an experiment we did with Dallas Theological Seminary, where here was their main navigation, the control. Here was the treatment. You can see we just added a uh, purple button to support DTS, and then in the second treatment here, we changed the purple button to donate. And in this case, in the first case, it helped increase donations 160% just by having that purple button. And in this case, the button with the donate call to action helped increase donations 190%, just making it clear to a visitor where they need to go or helping kind of nudge people with some subtle design like a button. This is why it's important. So another idea is just try having a clear donate button in your navigation. If you don't, that should be fairly straightforward. But then we looked at, well, what are people um, doing to call out recurring donations? And we, said, we found that three out of four organizations do not have any separate call to action for recurring donations. And here's why that can be important. So this is an experiment with the Texas State Historical Association that was a membership organization. And here was their, their control or their main navigation. But members can either join or renew. That's what people are kind of looking for. And so we said, well, what if we just split out those two calls to action and made it easier for people to just join or renew. And it helped increase uh, traffic to those donation pages 16%. Again, we're just helping guide and make it easier for people to find what it is they want to do. Or in this case, this, this comes from the Heritage Foundation. They have a membership monthly giving program as well. So here's their control. In the treatment here, we just took over a little bit of their homepage and had a value proposition about why you should become a monthly donor or a member. And in this case, it helped increase donations 46%. Here is a great example that we had in the study. It's Food for the Hungry. If you look at their top navigation here, see how they're calling out sponsor a child? It's bigger. It's got a different color. It grabs your eye. So if you're looking for it, it's easy to find. And if you're just kind of, mm, what should I be looking at? It will guide you towards that. So another thing to try is add a specific call to action or button or take some space on your homepage even to kind of move people towards recurring gifts in your navigation and homepage. All right, that was one of the things we learned. Here's another one that we learned is that it's not very clear why you should become a recurring donor. This is the value proposition question in our mind that every organization needs to 
answer because this is what donors are thinking, whether they'll tell you that or not. This is kind of what they're thinking. Why should I give to you rather than another organization or not at all? And it's that last option that we rarely consider. They do not have to give. <laughs> they definitely do not have to give. All right, so how do you answer this question? When it comes to recurring giving, the question looks more like this. Why should I give a recurring gift to you instead of a one-time donation and rather than some other organization or not at all? We have to communicate why or the value. So we looked at how did they communicate the recurring giving option. And it was kind of all over the board, to be honest. We couldn't find like one specific way that most organizations did. So we tried to kind of bucket them into these four approaches. So we had simple, first person, value prop, and creative. And so by far, the most organizations, about 68%, did the simple approach, which is something like this. You know, you go to click donate, and it just kind of has a toggle button, or it has an option to just make it monthly. So now, if you visited this page, how would you answer this question if you were a donor? Do you get anything that helps you answer that question? Unless you've already made up your mind that you, A, want to donate, and B, you want to give monthly, there is nothing being communicated in that donor experience that makes you think you should, you should make a recurring gift or just give to that organization at all, to be honest. So this was an issue when we looked at value prop. Only nine organizations tried to do anything in the way of a value proposition of why you should make a monthly donation. Here's a good example or a decent example from the ACLU. So one, just on their general case for support or the general value proposition, they have a good a title here and a name for their donors, join the ACLU. They have more copy with some bullets about why you should give and how. They have some visual reinforcement. Our research shows that that can go either way. But then they have some social proof, which is generally a good thing. No one wants to be the only one doing something. And then when you get into the donation side here, you can see that gentle little nudge about monthly giving where they're saying a monthly gift does even more to protect civil liberties, reinforcing the mission and nudging you towards a monthly gift. Something as simple as that can help move the value proposition question or answer it for a donor. So some other examples we saw, a monthly gift is the best way to stand up to Trump's agenda. A uh, monthly gift shows your commitment to care, support, and research. Or please support the pool every month. It's efficient, convenient, and flexible. Those are pretty simple options to just communicate value. And here's why communicating value largely through copy or text is so important. Uh, this is an experiment with the Illinois Policy Institute uh, where here was their main donation page, pretty standard looking donation page, and here was the uh, treatment page or the, the uh, experiment that we ran. The big difference here, as you can see on the left, there's really no copy. There's one sentence and then some social media icons. And on the right, we actually took some time to write out why someone should give. Just by adding that copy, it helps increase conversion rate or donations 150%. Even if someone has made up their mind, your copy and what you communicate can reaffirm why they should make this donation. But the vast, <clears throat> excuse me, the vast majority of people don't know. So you have to tell them and communicate it. So this is something I strongly suggest you try, adding a value proposition through copy. You can try different types for recurring giving on your donation page. One of the other things we kind of looked at was did an organization prompt donors? So instead of just allowing the option, did they kind of do something that was maybe a little bit more aggressive to kind of force a decision on the donor? And we saw only about 14% of organizations tried this. And it looked uh, some simple ideas like this where there was actually a toggle button that made you say yes or no uh, as opposed to like a, a passive checkbox. Or something more complex like this, like a pop-up that would come up right as, about you were to, as you were about to complete a one-time donation. This pop-up would come up and tell you about the, the, the value of making a monthly gift, and you could switch. So we thought that was actually pretty interesting. You know, why would you want to take someone away from a one-time donation, but you know, maybe this could work. So we actually ran this experiment. Uh, we ran this with folks on the family in the U.S. And on the left is their normal donation. And then on the right, this was a pop-up that came up right when people were about to click complete their one-time donation. Um, it went to 60% of whatever their one-time gift amount was or a minimum of $15 a month. And by adding this prompt, it helps increase recurring gifts 64%. And the key point here is the pop-up did not significantly impact the likelihood of a person giving a one-time gift. So the one-time donors just kept on going, and we were able to get even more people to choose, yeah, I do want to make a recurring gift. So that was actually on just one page. We ran this all on their whole site through all their donation pages. 
and we saw something similar, an increase of 24% in recurring gifts. And again, the pop-up did not significantly impact the likelihood of a person giving a one-time gift. The concept at play here is this thing called cognitive momentum. And if you think about like a rocket ship taking off, uh, of which I will never ride a rocket, and I'm not an astronaut, but the hardest part is taking off. That's where all the energy and um, you know, fuel and everything goes into it. But once it's kind of in motion and in space, it's actually relatively easy to just move a rocket ship, right? An object in motion remains in motion. And it's the same thing for us as we make decisions. The hardest part is getting someone started. And then once they're started, it gets a little bit easier. So we talk about a donor mountain at our organization as opposed to a donor funnel. Again, no one just wakes up and says, I want to give money away. But moving up the donor mountain, we have to use our email or our advertisement that leads to, say, like our uh, donation page, uh, which leads to the donation form. And all these things work together to keep that momentum going because at each little stage, should I open this email? Should I click this email? Should I read this landing page? How much should I give? Donors are evaluating the value and cost subconsciously of whether or not they should do this. And so the prompt just kind of, once they're in motion, they've already said, yeah, I do want to do this. The prompt keeps them in motion and presents another opportunity as opposed to coming right in from the get-go and say, do you want to give every month for as long as your credit card remains valid? That might scare some people, but if we can get them started by saying a little yes, then it, there's an opportunity there to kind of move to recurring giving. So cognitive momentum is the principle at play here, and maybe try adding a prompt for recurring gifts before one-time donation completion. Uh, we cover uh, cognitive momentum and this kind of approach in our landing page course, which is free. You can check it out at that URL. All right, so another thing that we learned is it actually wasn't that easy to set up. So if you found it and you wanted to do it, it wasn't the easiest to sign up, uh, to set it up. So we ended up getting blacklisted uh, by quite a few organizations because we were making a bunch of gifts. Now, not everyone is making you know, 345 donations through some similar credit cards, but if you think about things like Giving Tuesday or Year End or Giving Days, there are people making multiple donations to different organizations and they might be getting blacklisted. So a good principle that's maybe you know, gone awry. Um, we were asked for some really personal information that seemed kind of irrelevant, like our spouse's name. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure why they needed to know that. And so it's also extra information. That was kind of odd. We had to answer some weird, confusing questions. Like in this case, it was like agency location. We had no context for what agency location meant, yet it was required. So there wasn't a lot for us to, to go off of. It's a confusion. Uh, it's a point of confusion friction, what we'll call, what we call it. And we had to make commitments that we didn't understand, like this. I decline benefits. I don't know what the benefits are that I'm supposed to be declining or accepting. So yes, I don't know. It's confusing again. However, one of the worst things that we found, and I actually just found this yesterday uh, when I was talking to a possible client, was the amount of times we had to prove we were a human. Uh, we had to do this I'm not a robot thing. So I don't know how many robots are like, you know, scouring the World Wide Web to make charitable donations, but apparently it's something we have to fight against. <laughs> so then you have to do I'm not a robot, and then you get to pick the sign game, and it's like, is that a part of a sign, or is that a poll, or I don't really know, and you get it wrong, and you got to do it again. It's very frustrating. And think about a donor going through this before they make a gift, right? It's not a great experience. Uh, and every time I think of this, I think of a stand-up bit by John Mulaney who's talking about the world is run by robots and we spend most of our day telling them we're not a robot just so we can log on and look at our own stuff. Uh, it's pretty funny, but it's also uh, not safe for this webinar. So check it out on your own time. So does this even matter, right? These forms, confusion questions, does it even matter? Well, the answer is yes. Uh, here's an experiment from a research library where we took the exact same form on the left and just laid it out differently on the right. So we used horizontal space, so it looks easier on the eye. Less mental friction helped increase donations 40%. Or in this case, the only difference was here, there was a cell phone as a required field, decreased donations 43%. Causes anxiety maybe. People go, what are you going to use my phone number for? Are you going to call me every day? Are you going to text me? I don't know what you're going to do with this. Or we often see donation tools that have a confirmation page. So you click donate and then it kind of says, are you sure you want to complete this? We said, I don't know if that's really smart. So what if we just took that out? And just by taking out that extra step helped increase donations 176%. These are friction points and forms that are unnecessary. And if we can remove them, we can improve, improve the likelihood that someone will make a donation. Now, here was one neat example from an organization in the study where uh, once you start filling out your first name, it just expands to kind of show you some extra fields. 
that did the same thing for payments. Again, it's a way to limit that kind of mental uh, friction so it looks easy. And then once you start, you're more likely to complete. So try removing these confusion, confusing unnecessary form fields and donation steps, whether it's for one time or recurring. Uh, we actually have a little tool that you can use to help. So you can uh, go and make a donation. You can take this friction self-assessment. There's 20 questions that you can say yes, no to, and it'll kind of give you a score and some suggestions. Uh, it's at nextchapter.com slash resources hashtag tools. All right, the other thing was not all payment types were equal. It looks like my graph isn't going to pull through here. Oh, there we go. So we looked at payment types. So by far, um, every organization that accepted recurring donations accepted credit cards. And this was surprising. Only a third accepted EFT or ACH, or automated bank payments. This was surprising because of information like this, where that target analytics group found that the retention rate for EFT donors was 4% higher than credit card donors because credit cards um, get lost. Credit cards go expire. People move. They get divorced. Things happen with their credit cards. Less things happen with their bank account. A bank account is open on average for 16 years. Uh, according to bank rate, so it lasts longer. And it has no impact on one-time giving. So here's an experiment we ran where we just added the EFT option as a payment method, and it helped increase lifetime value 55%, and again, no significant difference in conversion rate. So there's very little downside, if any. It takes a little bit to set up. It's not the easiest, but it's got lower fees, and it helps increase lifetime value. So it's one of the things that we suggest you should try. Um, here's just an example of what that can look like, where people can say pay by check, bank information, account, verify, boom, set up. So try looking at an EFT ACH payment option, option for your recurring giving. And then the other thing that we saw is there wasn't much to do after a donation. So we just donated. Well, now what? Uh, well, the first point here is that roughly one out of three organizations uh, did not suggest anything for us to do after we made a donation. Um, the majority of organizations that did do something was a social share. And here was the opportunity missed, in our opinion, is that things like employee match, uh, make a second gift, or upgrade your gift. Very few organizations were taking advantage of that. And again, if you think about cognitive momentum, I've said yes to your organization. I've gone all the way through all that friction and said I'm not a robot and made a donation. I'm invested in your cause. Now, I'm in momentum. What else is it that I can do, or would you like me to do, or do I want to do? And here's an example um, from Alzheimer's Association where they had um, two calls to action, which generally isn't advised, but they talk about an employer match, which is something that's pretty easy for people to do. There's tools uh, out there that make this easier. And then they also talked about an upgrade. Or do you want to convert into a monthly donor? And here's why. The key thing is they explain why. So using the confirmation page to kind of continue a donation experience is something that we do a lot. Uh, with our clients and in our research, and we found that 10 to 20% of donors will give a second gift immediately if prompted, and the process is made easy, and there's a value proposition. So right after they made a one-time donation, the 10 to 20% of those donors will go on and make a second gift right away. It's, again, it's a cognitive momentum idea of things. So one of the things you can try on your confirmation page is ask for a recurring gift on that confirmation page. But again, you have to answer that question, why should they give a recurring gift to you? as opposed to one-time donation, and rather than another organization, or not at all. All right, so there's a recap of some of what we learned. It wasn't that easy to find. It wasn't very clear why we should, and it wasn't very easy to set it up. And there wasn't much to do after donation. Uh, these were the seven ideas that I shared. Uh, I won't go over them all. Hopefully, you've been jotting them down. But if you watch the recording or get the slides later, you can get them from there. All right, so that was on the giving experience side. Now we're going to talk more about what we learned on the recurring giving communications, right? Because we tracked all of it for three months. So here's the first thing. Recurring donors aren't treated that differently. So 38% of organizations in the study did not change their email strategy for recurring donors at all. And email was by far the most used channel and touch point. So when you take not a ton of change times a ton of volume, the donor experience didn't feel that, that different. Uh, and we look at, when we look at channel frequency uh, by donors, so we'll compare one time to recurring, we saw that um, recurring donors got about 10% fewer emails. They actually got about 60% more voicemail. We didn't get a ton of voicemail, so small sample size. This one I still don't fully understand, but they got 44% more direct mail, and then 50% uh, less text messages, but again, very small sample size. 
so that, that was kind of a channel, um, touch points by channel or organizations by channel. But we also looked at message types, and we broke them into three buckets. A receipt, this is more transactional, just acknowledging the gift. A cultivation, this was basically anything that wasn't a receipt or a solicitation, but the primary focus was on something other than fundraising. And then solicitation, so this is where the primary um, purpose was to generate support or donation. So what we found is that um, the recurring donors actually received fewer solicitations over the three months and received um, more cultivation, uh, which I think is good, right? They're giving every month already. They should receive fewer solicitations, and they should receive more cultivation. So that's generally good, but when we started looking at the chart over time, we saw something like this, where by month three, the number of organizations that were sending cultivation was starting to go down, and the number of organizations that were starting to send solicitations was going up. So that's a worrying potential trend. As time goes on, perhaps those two things kind of intersect, and maybe they go on to be treated not that differently than a one-time donor. So we also looked by volume. So the first chart was about organizations. This was just by volume. And we see another similar trend line where the number of solicitations are going up and the number of cultivation touch points are going down. So the worry here is that there's some immediate plan for how do we treat recurring donors differently than one-time donors, maybe in the first month or so. But as time goes on, the concern and what the trends potentially suggest, again, we only did three, three months of this, is that over time they kind of just get thrown back into the general pool. Right? They get treated just like any other donor in terms of how much they get solicited and how infrequently or frequently they get cultivated. The one thing to try here on your communication side is look at a longer-term plan specific to your recurring donors. They are goal. They give every month. They give more in a year. They give more over their lifetime. And um, having a separate communications plan is one way to, to ensure that they're engaged and treated properly, like the goal that they are. All right, we also looked at a number of communi uh, organizations by communication type and we saw that only nine organizations were actually sending a receipt or an acknowledgement in the third month. Now why that's important is if you remember this kind of science experiment where happiness was from giving smaller amounts more frequently, well if they don't acknowledge the gift or it just runs off their bank account and they don't even know, they can't get the reward from actually giving every month. So one of the ideas here is to actually communicate more often, and whether you send an official receipt or not, acknowledge their gift more regularly so they feel the happiness. One of the reasons why we don't, and we've heard this from people, is they're like, well, we don't want them to stop. We don't want to tell them that they have a recurring gift in case they stop. And to me, that's the wrong approach. That means we're treating donors like this. This is my cat, Thor, who is not very nice. <laughs> that's a very apt uh, picture of him where we feel like, you know, if he's gonna, donors are going to bite our hands off if we talk to them or mention that they're recurring donors. Let's just leave them alone and run their credit card until it expires or they die or something like that. I think we need to treat donors like this. This is my dog, Melly. He's just like a love fluff ball, Bernese Mountain Dog, who just eats up everything. Right? Do we think donors don't want to give and we're convincing them to, like, begrudgingly part with their money? Well, then we're going to treat them like that cat if we think they believe in what we're doing or we're helping them live up their values, we should treat them more like this. And I think that needs to make its way into our receiving and communication and acknowledgement plan. So one thing to try is try sending a thank you or a receipt every month. It doesn't have to be the same thing. It doesn't have to be in print. You don't have to send the receipt. The idea here is they give every month. Are you acknowledging them every month or frequently enough? A once-a-year statement saying, oh, thanks for giving all your long. I don't think cuts it. All right, another thing we saw was phone and text were not used very often. I mentioned this before, but only 15, only 15 organizations sorry, called us, and only two sent text messages. So what's interesting here is there's some research out there. This is from uh, Penelope Burt and the Donor Centered Fundraising. She found the donor second-year value could be up to 40% higher if they received a thank you call within 24 to 48 hours from a board member. So the power of the phone to kind of stand out and be personal can have a significant impact on someone's second-year value or likelihood to be retained. So a pretty simple thing to try is just try calling or texting your donors to say thank you. So one of the reasons, one of the things we were wondering is like, well, why was there so little usage of the phone? And part of it is um, some people weren't collecting it. So one out of four organizations were not collecting the phone number. 
uh, which kind of makes sense if, uh, you know, I mentioned this study earlier where adding the cell phone is required, decreased donations 43%. But what we found is just by making the cell phone field optional on forms often has no significant difference. So the more that you make required, the, the more the donors feel like they have to because they have to. <laughs> and it raises these questions where if it's just uh, optional, they can choose to give it or not. Uh, so if you are going to collect phone numbers, if you have a strategic plan for how you're going to use it, Try making that uh, optional as opposed to required. Otherwise, you might be losing a bunch of donors that you will never be able to call because they never gave. Something to try there. Another thing was communications were not very personal. So 9% of organizations did not send us any communication to the monthly donor. Nothing. So again, Captain Obvious coming in here, try communicating <laughs> with your monthly donors if you're sending nothing. And that was over a three-month time period as well. Another thing we saw, 13% of organizations didn't send cultivation content of any kind to any donor. Captain Obvious coming in again, try cultivating all of your donors. And just one in five organizations ever sent a message from a, an address representing a real person, so a person's name. The vast majority came from people who were uh, like info or generic type senders. We also got a lot of communication that looked like this. So here is an email subject, donation form acknowledgement. Maybe that's that robot coming back. And it was sent from donor receipt app. This is the worst email, definitely not the best. But things like this, friends, big hearts like yours. Like we've given you our name at least once. Why are you calling us friends? And the subject, who it's from, uh, are, are, and this preview text part are hugely important to why people even open email. This is a research study by Litmus and Fluent. They looked at why do people open emails or how do they triage their inbox. Sender or from name is the most important thing that people look at. Not subject line, not preview text, who it's from. So here's some experiments from our uh, research library or one where instead of sending it from the organization, we just sent it from Kent, the person, up to increase opens 28%. And this is a general thing that we found is sending emails from a person as a person helps increase open and engagement. So try sending your emails to one person, not an organization. The same kind of concept can apply to things like subject line. So here we have moms equals the heart of caring bridge, pretty marketing, versus something like you amaze me, Jeff, which is a lot more personal, uses the word you. Helped increase opens 137%. We found that you is kind of a secret word. I mean, we know this in direct mail, but it applies to email. Just by using you and your references and subject lines can help increase open rates. And calling people by name. Here's a test where the only difference here in this email is on one, we didn't have their name, and another, we said hi, Jeff, or use their name. Helped increase clicks 270%. So try using people's first name, or at least uh, their full name if you have it. This is important. Fundraising is personal. It's relational. If we don't mention their names, we don't talk to you or them, then how is it personal or relational? So why is this important? Just a couple experiments, again, from a research library. On the left, we have kind of a classic kind of templated email, right, with the preview text and the header image, text button, and sign off. And on the right, spoiler alert, I just gave it away, but on the right, we took out a lot of the design elements, left the button, and helped increase clicks 80% 80%, and donations 112%. We said, well, this feels more personal. What if we took that even further and we ran a follow-up test so we got that kind of winning email, which is now the control on the left, and then the treatment we actually pulled out all the design elements. We took out the button, um, and we moved the logo, made it smaller, and moved it to the bottom. And in this case, it helped increase donations 145%. And if you actually look at the copy, uh, I won't dive into this too, too much, but if you go through it, after we reduced the logo, um, the call to action was not a button. Friends don't send friends buttons for calls to action. They use links. Um, but if you dig into the copy, we had a more personal, relevant salutation. On the left, it was, you know, when the world has been turned upside down, like this preacher message, where on the right, it's like, hey, I know you've been using CaringBridge, which is our site, right? It's more personal and contextual. And if you actually get into it further, on the left, it's still kind of preaching into a story. And on the right, it's like, hey, right now, we're in a short campaign to raise money for you, those like you. We're talking to a person as opposed to preaching at a person. So when you kind of add it all up, this more personal approach helped lead to the significant increase in donations. People give to people, not email machines. That's a principle that we believe. It's something that we'll teach and train a lot because that's what our research suggests. It's all in our email course as well if you want to learn more about that. And then customer service emails. We found, this, we found the same thing. The vast majority of customer service emails 
to, to get back a lost card were transactional and not personal, or a canceled card, 82% were transactional and not personal. And what's interesting is every single email that was sent from a person went into the inbox tab, so you're using Gmail for this, for this research, as opposed to promotions or spam. So even if all you wanted to do is just get in the inbox, you should be sending it from a real person as opposed to a transactional focused email. So try making your customer service emails look, sound, and feel like they are from a real person. We found this in other channels too. We got phone calls saying like, hi, my name is, I'm a paid caller from vendor. That's not a great way to say thanks. <laughs> uh, I know there's some you know, things that you have to do when you're doing a paid call, but if it's a thank you, you don't have to do that. Uh, and then the mail, here we go, dear friends, uh, dear partner, uh, we've got account numbers going on. This didn't feel personal, like you don't know who we are. People give to people, not email machines, but the principle is people give to people, period. All right. The last thing that we found, or at least that we'll cover today, is customer service leads much to be desired. I already covered some of this on the communication side, how few organizations were receding or sending cultivation or didn't send us anything. And the majority of communication didn't feel very personal. And this is why it's important. Uh, Roger Craver, who is the editor at the Agitator, great blog, did a bunch of research for a donor retention book. And he found that when it comes to improving lifetime value, again, it's that main metric, confetti, celebration, the tactics, techniques, and frequency of activity from the fundraising department or kind of the asking side of the house accounts for less than 20% of the ultimate value on a donor file. The vast majority comes from the customer experience and ongoing communications you provide. If it's not there, if it's not personal, you will be losing donors and losing lifetime value. And it's not about how much you ask. It's about the other things. So that's the customer experience side of things. So what happens when we lost? Uh, or, or reported lost or, or canceled credit cards. Well, the good news was two out of three organizations were able to automatically update the cards without any intervention. So their payment processing tool just updated it, which is great. So you should use those payment processors and um, talk to your providers and see if they have that feature because it's seamless. It's great. Because 75% of the organizations who didn't automatically update the card did nothing at all to recover it. They didn't call us. They didn't email us. They just let it go off into the distance with nothing happening. And we reported it as canceled, and when we canceled the card, just under half actually um, did not reach out at all to get a new card in that analysis window. So here's the side by side. So what this indicates is that there's not really a response plan, or the, the plan is in place, but it's not getting the information quick enough about a card that's been canceled or lost or lapsed. And one of the things here that's going on is that if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. And so this isn't what research suggests. This is what my experience would suggest is that if we're not really measuring these things, it's hard for us to improve them, or we can't make one person own this. If you said our goal is to reduce this and you're in charge, Jonathan, things will change. So again, it needs to rise in importance and get that buy-in. All right, so some of what we learned about recurring giving communication. Um, recurring donors weren't treated that differently. Phone texts were not used very often. Communications were not that personal, and the customer service side leads quite a bit to be desired still. Uh, here were six of those ideas uh, that I mentioned. Again, I won't go over all of them. You can try to test or experiment with those. And if you want to go deeper on this study, um, you can get this whole study with all of our research and insights at recurringgiving.com. It's got more on like gift arrays and premiums, some things that we didn't talk about, and it's got a lot more ideas of things that you can try and test. Um, you can also benchmark yourself at this site. So that's the URL. You should be able to find it from recurringgiving.com. But you can actually go in, make a donation to yourself, and go through the same methodology that we did. Do the same kind of thing. Choose these yes, no questions. Uh, it'll tell you how you did compared to others. We'll try to give you a grade and even chart you out compared to uh, your gift arrays and things like that, how you compared to other organizations. So that's where you can check it out. And if you like this kind of like nerdy research optimization stuff, we've got a conference coming up where that's all that we're really talking about. We've got some great people from for-profit and non-profit, and two in particular, uh, Manager of Demand at Charity Water and Senior Manager of Retention at Compassion. They will be, both be talking about recurring giving as will I. Uh, so if you want to come on down, check it out, neosummit.com. You can use the code Bloomerang and save 300 bucks. And that is all that I have for today. Uh, you can find all of our stuff at nextafter.com. That's my email if you have other questions or you disagree or something like that. And I think we have uh, at least 10 minutes now uh, for some questions. 
we do. Thanks, Brady. That was awesome. Just want to say thank you, uh, first of all, for not only gathering all that data, which I know is a, a monumental task, but thank you for, for coming on and, and presenting it. Really cool stuff. Can't say I'm super surprised by some of the things you found, um, but really interesting insights. I love the, the ideas you gave people, especially, you know, making phone number non-required, stripping out all that uh, design element. So, yeah, follow Brady's advice. Try some of those things. I mean, you never know uh, until you try something, right? So, so thanks, Brady. That was really, really cool. We got lots of questions, probably more than we can get to um, in 10 minutes. But I'm going to kind of combine a, some similar questions here, Brady. Lots of people are asking about um, other sort of time horizons for recurring gifts. Do you, did you encounter anyone else uh, asking for things besides monthly? Did you see quarterly, like annual recurring? Like is that a thing where you make an annual gift but it, it automatically charges every year? Is that something that you see, recommend? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, it's a good question. It is something that we captured um, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me. There was, there was about six organizations, I think, that asked for something that wasn't monthly and recurring. Uh, and I think there was okay. only one that kind of had an annual. Most often you'll see the annual thing for like membership organizations. So people can choose to renew right. their membership annually as opposed to monthly. Uh, you really don't find that a lot for kind of the average donor or non-membership based organization. Um, I don't have or we don't have any research that would show, you know, like a quarterly pledge is better than not. Um, that's definitely something worth trying, though, because, you know, potentially someone would say a quarterly basis works better because of their business or because of who they are. And it operates on the same principle of they make the decision once and it goes on. Uh, maybe they can do larger amounts. I think monthly is just more common. So, uh, you know, that's what yeah. we found, at least, you know, the vast majority did it. So it could be something worth trying. I haven't seen any research that says it's worse. I haven't seen any research that says it's better. Uh, so you could try it. Okay, cool. Um, what about uh, a lot of people also ask uh, along, the, along the same line um, about like branding the monthly giving program, like calling it something like, you know, Circle of Hope, or, or some, you know, giving it kind of a name, almost like a, a giving society. Is is that something you saw and and would recommend, or do most people just say, you know, join our monthly giving program, join our sustaining giving program, kind of an in between brand name, I, su I suppose. What do you think about that? Yeah, another great question. Um, about twenty four percent of organizations had a named program. Uh, of some okay. kind, meaning like, you know, circle of hope or something like that. Um, yeah. Now, whether or not you should do that, again, I don't have the research. We haven't ran that experiment. Um, I think the logic behind naming it is sound, meaning you're trying to, again, if the answer is why should you make a recurring gift as opposed to a one-time gift, having a name program can maybe help answer some of that, either in the name or just kind of uh, helping it stand out. It gives you something different than like recurring giving to use like in a, in a call to action, perhaps, you know, join a program, especially if it's named well. Uh, and if you're trying to treat these donors differently or maybe build some community or use some exclusivity, I think all of those factors are generally good, and it's a little bit easier if you do have a named program. So I think there's some okay. good logic to it. Uh, I can't advocate for it with research. I know that uh, my default when I had my own agency was we did do named programs because I thought and still think that is a better approach, generally speaking, but that's not research backed. That's just you know Brady backed. <laughs> yeah. Well, I trust Brady backed for sure, and it seems like it, it aligns with your advice of you know ab advertising it or, or in, in a way that provides value and a, and a reason to do it. It seems like that kind of goes along with with giving it sort of a special name. So that makes sense to me. Um. Lots of people ask about age, Brady. Any data on um, likelihood that uh, a donor of a certain age would be more likely to opt into a, a recurring giving program? I, I can't think of anything I've seen that, that lends itself to that, but I'm curious if, if you've had any experience there. No, the, what I would say is, is generally monthly giving um, is uh, accessible for every age demographic. 
Um, yeah, especially like again, you look at the subscription e-commerce, which is generally a little younger. But people growing up, we just have Netflix and Dropbox and like everything subscription based. So why would giving to my charity not be subscription based as well? That you know, it's a kind of a, a natural concept for younger donors. And traditionally, yeah. older donors have been kind of the gold mine. So they would mail checks in every month, and that was more of a sense of kind of tithing or duty or regularity. Um, so I think it, it's accessible to pretty much every age demographic, but for pretty different reasons. Um, you know, why they would do it is different, but the transaction, the transaction method is very accessible to, to different age demographics. Makes sense. Uh, upgrade. Let's say you've got monthly donors. They're all given $10 a month. How do, you, how do you broach the subject of moving them from maybe $10 a month to, to $15 a month? Is it just a matter of asking? It seems like probably most organizations don't think to ask. Is that probably the biggest barrier, just, just trying it? Or maybe there are other ways to broach the subject? It's a really good question. Um, one, it wasn't part of this study. Right? We did a three month, and this was more like just setting it up and converting what was the initial experience. So we don't have any you know, research on upgrades. Um, we haven't spent a lot of time focusing on upgrades. So what I will say, and this is more of a strategic slash philosophical view, um, A, you don't get what you don't ask for. So if you're interested in upgrading, yeah. for sure you have to ask. Right? That's, that's definitely part of the case. And you always have to communicate the value of why. Why, why do you need an extra five months? Why what, five bucks? Why should they give five bucks more a month? It can't be just, we need another five dollars, please. <laughs> like, that's a terrible upgrade strategy. So that being said, I personally think that we spend too much time trying to squeeze more out of the stone as opposed to finding new resources or new donors. So instead okay. of trying to, you know, maximize more of how do we move a 30-month donor to a 35, a 35 to a 40, how can we spend more time finding a brand new $30 a month donor or turning a $20 one-time gift donor into a $15 a month recurring donor. To me, that is a much higher growth strategy. Uh, it fits more with honoring a donor. Right? If we said, please join our program at this month, and then three months in, we're saying, hey, it's actually 10% more, pony up. Like, there's something philosophically that rubs me the wrong way, and I've had that happen with child sponsorship organizations in particular. Um, yeah. So my general view is a, a better upgrade strategy is like honor and thank the crap out of them for being a monthly donor, and then potentially yep. provide different opportunities to give. Could be a matching thing at year end, a related gift to the program. So that's what child sponsor programs often do. You know, it's their birthday. Do you want to do a one-time gift, and they'll get you know notebooks or something. I think that's a better donor-focused, value-oriented way to get more money out of a current donor as opposed to just asking for five bucks more a month. Um, but again, this is more of my personal philosophy, and the general idea is we need to be better at finding new donors. If we're just squeezing more out of the donors we have, we're all screwed. Uh, so not to say you shouldn't do that, but I, I see a disproportionate amount of time focused on upgrading as opposed to acquisition or conversion. Makes sense. Well, we're, we're coming up on 1 o'clock, and I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, any last bit of advice, Brady? What, what should people do this afternoon? Maybe donate to themselves and kind of see what their process is like, probably for the first time in some cases? Yeah, I'd say um, download the study <laughs> because it has a lot more to answer some of the questions that you have. Um, but I think that idea of signing up for your own emails, making donations to yourself, or setting up recurring gifts is – unbelievably useful. Um, what's tough is that you'll still do it with your own kind of donor-centric lens, so you'll, you'll, you're not unbiased. But some things like the form fields and maybe you're asked to be a robot, do you have a value proposition? You know, some of these things you maybe don't even know, and that's fine. I didn't know that when I was a marketing director. <laughs> so, you know, that's one of the principles I say all the time is you should be signing up and making a donation to your organization every single quarter and just seeing what the experience is. Or give 25 bucks to your friend and tell them to do it and screen grab it all, or something like that. Because too often, you know, a year goes by and it's like, oh, crap, have we been doing that for that long? So I think that's a great suggestion. Uh, you can download the study. And then maybe commit to trying one thing. Whether you run an official experiment, you remove a form field, you add some copy, just commit to doing one thing differently that you think can improve and optimize your recurring giving program. Start with that and see where that leads. I love it. 
Man, this is awesome, Brady. Go to recurringgiving.com, right? That's to get the study. I get that. That's right. correct. Yeah, cool. Yeah, and go to the NIO Summit also. Got a coupon code for you, uh, coupon code Boomerang. 300 bucks off. That's a pretty good deal, I would say. So thanks for doing that, Brady. And uh, thanks for being here. This is really cool. I really appreciate all the, the advice. It looks like people, based on what I see in the chat, also enjoyed it. So uh, thanks, awesome. man. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And thanks, thanks to all of you for hanging out today for an hour out of your day. I know you're probably busy, so it's always good for you, for me to see you all uh, joining us every Thursday. Uh, but like I said at the top, look for an email from me. I'll be sending out the slides and the recording later on this afternoon, so I'll get all that good stuff in your hand. But I know we didn't get to all the questions, but I told Brady uh, we'd get him the questions. He may reach out to you individually uh, if we didn't get to your questions, so be on the lookout for that. And we're going to send you a little survey afterwards, so uh, don't be shy. Let us know how you, uh, how you thought of it. I don't think you'll hurt Brady's feelings, uh, but we'll always be looking <laughs> for, uh, for feedback. So uh, appreciate all you being here. We've got uh, very cool webinars coming up ourselves here over the next few weeks or so. We've got one next week, of course, next Thursday, same time, same place. we got Tammy Zonker, uh, awesome consultant, super smart, one of our favorites. She's going to talk about how trust can inform your fundraising efforts. Uh, not something we see a lot of. We focus on a lot of other things, not so much trust. So uh, check that one out. It's a good session. I've seen her give it live. Uh, definitely worth your time, worth your hour. So register for that. If you can't make it, or maybe that doesn't quite fit with your fancy, check out our webinar page. There's lots of other sessions you can uh, register for. So hopefully we'll see you next week or uh, some other week in the future. So we'll call it a day there. Have a good rest of your Thursday. Look for an email from me. We'll talk to you again soon. Bye now.